Romans chapter 14 will be our text today, verses 13 through verse 23. When you're there, say, I got it. You got it? Romans 14, 13 through 23. I want to ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. And it says this. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in, and of, in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So, do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Amen. You may be seated. And I am going to preach this morning with the Lord's help on these verses. And I'm going to title my sermon, How to Give Up Your Rights. How to Give Up Your Rights. Sound exciting? Let's pray one more time and just ask God for His help. Father, we ask one more time that You would help us as we study this text. It's a text that challenges all of us, no matter our preferences, convictions, no matter our background or culture no matter our conscience or our liberties, we are challenged by this text, and we ask that you would help us and grow us to be like Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. How to give up our rights. The great set of philosophers known as the Beastie Boys once said, I am going to fight for my right to party. (laughs) The mantra of our day is, I do what I want. The mantra of our day is, nobody can stop me. Floyd Money Mayweather said in an interview last year, he says, I do what I want to do, and I say what I want to say. Now, I'm convinced that Romans chapter 14 is one of the least popular chapters in the book of Romans. If not in the whole Bible. It's a chapter that intrigues us. It's a chapter that often comes up in conversation. But in our flesh, I don't think it's a chapter that we particularly like. Why? Because we love our freedoms. 
We love our liberties. We love our rights that we have in Christ. Today, my ability to exercise my freedoms is nearly tantamount to my humanity. And so we love passages such as Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, which says, It is for freedom that the Lord has set you free, so stand firm then in your freedoms. But then we come to Romans 14. And this morning we read that we are to lay aside our freedoms for the sake of another. This text is hard for us because what is prohibited in this text is what feels natural. And what is required in this text feels unnatural. Let me show you what I mean. What does Paul prohibit? Well, he says, do not destroy the one for whom Christ has died. We love to destroy things. Destruction is easy for us. You know, the best part of renovating 1500 Druid Hill Avenue has been demolition. A couple Sundays ago, me and a couple guys from the church went over there and started hacking away at lights in the fellowship hall. And it was fun. And we walked away just feeling a little bit more manly than we felt going into it. In our flesh, we love to destroy things. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 does tell us that we ought to destroy false arguments. But the problem is this, is that when we feel judged by somebody wrongly, we feel judged. We don't want to just destroy their argument. We want to destroy them. We want to destroy people. We don't want to be united with people that are different from us. We don't want to be associated with people that are different from us. We don't even want to be in heaven with them. And so when Paul says, hey, don't destroy each other, we bristle at that. Because we're good at destruction. And then we read verse 19, what we are to do, what we're commanded to do. He says, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Why is this text hard? Well, it's because the one is easy and feels very natural, and it's something that we get excited about, destruction. But the other, well, that feels boring. What fun is there in pursuing peace? What fun is there in mutual upbuilding with people that I disagree with? One of these is natural for us. The other one requires grace. In, in the context here that Paul is writing to, there has been a clash of culture between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. They're coming together now in one church, but they come with very different theological and cultural backgrounds. Now, in this context, the Gentiles, the Gentile Christians are the theologically strong. So when he's referring to the strong, he's referring to the person who gets the fact that they have liberties in Christ. They know that they can eat pork. They know that they can have some bacon if they want. Amen. Amen. They know that they, don't, they can kind of trim their beard however they want to trim it, and they're not bound by uh, dress codes. And so they're referred to as the strong. The Jewish Christians in this context would be considered the weak, those who are coming from the background of the Mosaic Law, and while they understand justification by faith in Jesus Christ, they still struggle to believe that they are freed from Sabbath laws. 
they still struggle to believe that they can have some pork tenderloin. They still believe that abstaining from these things and practicing other things is what God requires of them. And so they haven't arrived theologically where the Gentile Christians are at. Therefore, they are weak in faith. That's what he means by that. Look at verse 19, or verse 14 rather. Paul here theologically sides with the Gentile Christians. Now Paul himself, remember, is Jewish. He, 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 he uh, was persecuting the Christians. He was uh, a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He had followed all of the codes and the rules and the regulations, but he has come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so in verse 14, Paul says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Nothing. Now, going back to the Old Testament, the Jewish Christians, or I'm sorry, the Jews in the Old Testament lived under the regulation of the Mosaic law. All of their life was framed by rules and regulations that were set by God in the law that regulated all of their lives, rules and regulations which were designed to make them a per peculiar people. Now, Paul here in verse 14 is saying, I am persuaded in the Lord that nothing is itself unclean. What Paul is saying is this, considering the work of Christ, considering all that the Lord Jesus has done and is for us, I am persuaded in Him, framed by the gospel that nothing which previously was declared unclean is now clean. So Paul here is pointing us to Jesus, and he's saying, because of Christ, I'm persuaded that eating pork is not a sin. That not observing the Sabbath day is not a sin. That if you would like to trim your beard or shave it off completely, you are free to do so. Now these things in the Old Testament were signposts. They were shadows uh, of something that was greater to come. Jesus came, and Jesus lived a perfectly clean life. In other words, Jesus was the real thing. He was the real thing which all of the ceremonies and all of the sacrifice, uh, uh, sacrifices shadowed. On the cross, the clean became unclean so that unclean people might be made clean. Are you with me? Turn to Hebrews 10 really quick if you would, if you're quick on the draw. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Paul says or the writer, uh, the author of Hebrews, whoever it is, it, talking about this very thing, talking about all of the Old Testament regulations, all of the practices, all of the sacrifices. They say this in verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 10. He says, for since the law is but a shadow, somebody say shadow. shadow. The law of Moses is a shadow, shadow. not the thing, but a shadow of good things that are to come. I'm right now looking at Elder Eric's shadow. The shadow is not Eric. But the shadow tells you that somebody's sitting between the floor and the lights. He's saying the law was not the thing itself, but a shadow of the thing, good thing to, the, uh, the good things to come. Instead, of the true form of these realities. 
Therefore, it, the law, can never by the same sacrifices that are continually, continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Meaning, all of the regulations were never meant to justify anybody. They were shadows of the one who would come to be able to justify ungodly, unclean sinners. Skipping down to verse 9, he says that he, Jesus, comes and he does away with the first in order to establish the second, meaning he puts aside the first system in order to establish the second system. Verse 14, this is how he does it. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Meaning Christ, in His death on the cross, accomplished everything that the law was pointing to. In Christ, the Mosaic law then, therefore, is fulfilled. And so what Paul is saying is that, is that in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm persuaded that if you want to bring bacon to the men's uh, uh, fellowship uh, breakfast, you are free, and more than welcome to, bring some bacon. If you want to go bowling on the Sabbath, you can go bowling. If you want to shave your face, you can shave. If you want to practice uh, various holidays, you're free to do so. And if you would like to abstain from holidays, you're free to do so. If you want to uh, celebrate Juneteenth coming up right around the corner, and then you also want to light fireworks on the 4th of July, he's saying it's all available to you. There's nothing ceremonially or traditionally that is clean or unclean because it all is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, sin is always sin. All right, so don't, don't get me wrong and, and don't get Paul wrong and begin to believe that Paul is saying that there is no such thing as sin anymore. Sin is always sin. But the ceremonial and cultural trappings of the law were fulfilled in Christ, and God does not require them for your holiness, for your acceptance, for fellowship with Him. Meaning Christians don't have a dress code. <laughs> hey, Christians don't have dietary restrictions. Christians are not marked off by how we look. So Paul is in total agreement with the, uh, the, the um, Gentile Christians. Now, in Galatians, Paul gets on to the Judaizers. In Galatians, it's kind of flipped. And in Galatians, Paul is rebuking those who are requiring Gentile Christians to become like Jews in order to enjoy table fellowship. The problem in Rome, I believe, is the opposite. What's happening in Rome is that the Gentile Christians who are liberated in these various ways are requiring Jewish Christians to become like them in order to enjoy table fellowship. Jewish Christians here still believe that all of these ceremonial traditions are required by God. So therefore, for verse 14 continues... He says, everything is clean, but, he says, it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. Oh, somebody scratch your head and say, what does that mean? How can something be clean, but then become unclean if you think it is unclean? Well, verse 23 goes on to explain this. Look at verse 23. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats. Because the eating is not from faith, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Let's break this down here. Whoever doubts is condemned if he eats. Now, doubting and stumbling are two sides of the same coin. Consider Peter, when Peter uh, saw Jesus walking on the water, and Peter says, hey, can I hop out and join you on the waters? And, and he jumps, and he lands on the water, and for a moment, he stands on the water with Jesus Christ. But then quickly, he begins to sink. 
Jesus rescues Peter, and what does Jesus say to Peter? He says, Peter, why did you doubt? You see, doubting is not trusting in the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. And so doubting then leads us to falter. It leads us to stumble. Forcing, here's the key to understanding this, forcing a Jewish Christian to act against their conscience disconnects the behavior from belief. Meaning, if they doubt in their eating, if they believe that eating this piece of bacon is an act of rebellion against God, and they go forward with that, they are now sinning, not because of the action, but because of their heart. Anything done in rebellion to God apart from faith, therefore, is sin. You know, so if God says, hey, or if I believe, hey, God uh, pro- prohibits me from wearing a white button down, which is usually what, I, what you would think I would believe, God prohibits me from wearing a white button down, and I put it on, it would become an act of rebellion against God, in, not in the action itself, but in my heart. And now this would then open up Pandora's box of rebellion to the Jewish Christian. Let me give you an example of this. Suppose someone is coming from a background of alcoholism. For them, when they were young, teenager, alcohol was purely associated with drunken parties. In their 20s, they partied, and they, uh, uh, they, they drank, they drank like a fish, and their drinking led them to sinful activities every single time. In their mid-20s, this individual became a Christian and joined a church, and for the next two decades was part of a church community which told them that all drinking, even a sip of beer or a sip of wine, All drinking is a sin. Now, two decades later, they attend a new church. And in this new church, this church is filled with Christians who know their freedom in Christ. This church is filled with Christians who know that you can have a beer with your bratwurst, and it's not a sin. And many Christians in this church enjoy their freedoms. This man coming to this church, being the weaker, Paul is saying, if we require this man to become like us, in order to enjoy table fellowship, we are causing him to sin. Why? Because for him, it would be an act of rebellion to take a drink in this current state, in his current understanding, with his current heart. And Paul is saying you're putting him, his soul then, into great danger. Why? Not because of the deed itself, but because of the de- what the deed would mean for his life. It would be for him an act of rebellion and would open up opportunities for current uh, continual rebellion against God. So, therefore, in verse 20 and verse 21, he, he says, don't then do anything that would cause somebody to stumble. Now, this is getting to the heart of Paul's message on unity. Remember, the book of Romans is all about the gospel and then as it's played out, what Paul is doing is he's saying, hey, there are these two very different groups in Rome, Jew and Gentile, and we must be one in order to display the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. Paul wants there to be unity and peace in the church. 
And so as he's getting at that, and as he understands fully the challenges that are at play in, the, in these, these, these churches, what does Paul call the strong two? What he says is this. He says, lay aside your liberties for the sake of the weak. Lay aside your liberties for the sake of the weak. How do we do that? Because that's hard. How do we do that? The answer is in the power of the kingdom. Let me show you quickly three kingdom ethics from this text which drive us to lay aside our liberties for the sake of the weak. Look at verse 13. The first one is love. Love. Verse 13, he says, therefore, remember verses 1 through 12, therefore, instead of judging those who don't follow your extra biblical rules and despising those who are not as strong in their theology on these things as you are, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. But rather, decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. A young believer once asked me, he said, why don't Christians have a uniform? Like, I think more people would be drawn to Christianity if we all dressed a certain way and kind of were distinct. Like, you look at the Muslims, they got a uniform. They wear a certain robe, and the Jews have a uniform. Like, why don't the Christians have a uniform? Well, it's because... We are not marked off by our looks, but we're marked off by our love. That's what makes us distinct in the world. So why pursue unity instead of judgment? Why should I lay aside my privileges for the sake of the weak? Verse 15 gives us the basis for verse 13. So if you're looking at this, the structure of this text, verse 13, verse 13 makes the statement, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another. Verse 14 is a little bit of a parenthesis saying, hey, I get it. I agree with you. Nothing is unclean. Verse 15 then begins with a four grounding verse 13. Are you with me on that? So this is why we ought not pass judgment, but rather decide to not put a stumbling block in front of somebody. Here's the reason. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you no longer walk in love. That's the reason. Somebody say, I want to walk in love. All right. Therefore, if we want to walk in love, look at verse 15. It continues, second half. You're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. What you eat, he's saying, or what you drink, has the potential of confusing the weaker brother, which could lead them to an act of heart rebellion, thus destroying that, those for whom Christ died, and leaving them ashamed before God. What displays a Christian, then, is not the embrace of our liberties, but rather it's the embodiment of love. What does Jesus say in John chapter 13, verse 35? He says, By this you will know, By this, they will know, rather, that you are my disciples. By this, by what? They will know that you are my disciples. By what? Because you eat pork. Because you drink wine. By this, they will know that you're my disciples. Because you observe the Sabbath. Because you wear regular clothes. And you're not prone toward any kind of dress code. By this they will know, because you smoke a cigar, because you eat a donut, or because you allow your kids to go trick-or-treating. Are these the things that show the world who we are? 
that we are indeed the disciples of Jesus Christ. No. He says, he says that you love one another. By this you will know. By this they will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Meaning, church, when we are in endless debates about these, these kinds of issues, drawing lines between ourselves, gossiping among ourselves, destroying one another in trying to prove a point, what he's saying is that, is that we are not operating in love. If, 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 if I have the right, if I have the liberty, say, and the money to buy something really nice, which I don't, but if I did, and if I knew that ownership of that thing would cause a weaker brother that I'm working with to stumble into greed, to misunderstand things, and, and then uh, uh, be tempted toward this, a similar kind of purchase, which would be an act of heart rebellion for him, then perhaps I ought not to buy that thing. If, if I have the right to drink wine and a weaker brother is prone to idolizing wine, then perhaps I don't drink wine in front of my brother. If, if I am free to embrace various cultural traditions, but those very cultural traditions could cause for sinning in another individual, then I ought to, I ought to abstain. In the trenches of, of Christian life, like there are hundreds and hundreds of applications of this. I'm almost, I'm almost tempted to not give any application because that's kind of what Paul does. He leaves it so open-ended because the application is like in the minutia of how we love each other. It's in the weeds of how we relate to each other. We love. We love. That's the framework for what it means to be a Christian. And that's what he leaves us. Act in love. The second is this. It's peace. The second kingdom ethic which drive us to lay aside our liberties out of love for others is a pursuit of peace, not war. Look at verse 16 as he continues. Verse 16, he says, So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Let what you regard, don't let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. What he's saying is, is don't allow something that God has called good, you know, such as bacon, all right, good example. Amen. Taking something that is good, don't allow it to be spoken of as evil, meaning don't allow it to become something that is a, a, a stumbling block. Don't be, allow it to become something that is a problem. If pork is good and within the Christian, our, our Christian liberty to eat it, he's saying don't make pork a thing of contention. Why? Well, because that's not what the kingdom of God is all about. Meaning, we're not going to get to heaven one day and, and, and walk through the pearly gates and be like, man, heaven is all about some teriyaki marinated pork tenderloins. That's not what heaven is about. What is heaven about? He goes on to tell us, he says, it's about righteousness, the kingdom of God is about peace, and the kingdom of God is about joy in the Holy Spirit. And he's just giving us his outline of Romans. Romans chapter 3, justification. By, by faith alone, we are made righteous by God's work through Jesus Christ, imputed righteousness. Romans chapter 5, we have then, therefore, since we're justified by faith, peace with God. Romans chapter 8, it's all about the heights of our joy in the Holy Spirit. 
He's saying these are the things that the kingdom of God is about, righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so verse 18 then sums it all up. And he says this is what, serve, this is what life is all about. It's about serving Christ. Serving Christ is what God wants of us. Serving Christ is what leads to the approval of our fellow believers. And so therefore, Paul is leaving us with this challenge saying, let us not be known for our freedoms, but let us be known as those who serve Christ. And that then leads us to verse 19. Look at verse 19 with me. So then, here's his application. Let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. And this challenges both sides. Jewish Christians pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Gentile Christians pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Up buildings. It challenges all of us, no matter which side we fall on. Look, I have never known a church to split because everybody was pursuing peace. But I have known of churches who split over music styles. I've known of churches who split over Bible translations. I recently read of a church that split over whether or not it was appropriate to clap after baptisms. Kent Hughes said this on, on this text. Kent Hughes said, the easy solution to this problem in Romans would have been for Paul to say, hey, form two churches, the church of the carnivores and the church of the vegetarians. But Paul, fortunately, was committed to the nobler, though far more difficult solution. And that is, instead of dividing to pursue peace and mutual upbuilding. Paul is saying, if we are driven by the kingdom of God and by the values of the kingdom of God, then therefore we are united in love and thus we must pursue peace. Why is this hard for us? Two reasons. Number one, it's because we want to win. Like, I love winning arguments until I win the argument and realize I've now got a broken relationship. Amen. In our flesh, we love to win. And let me just remind you that in Christ, you've already conquered. You see, gospel people no longer need to win because we are victors in Christ. Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection, has conquered sin and death. And you are a victor, and so is your brother. Amen. A second reason this is hard for us is because we want to be justified. If and when you feel judged wrongly for embracing the liberties that you have in Jesus Christ, you want to justify yourself. But saints, we are justified in Christ. Yet again, the gospel frees us to be able to live with people who wrongly judge us knowing that we have a cosmic two thumbs up in Jesus Christ. Is God's approval of you not enough? So in other words, to sum this up, you don't need to eat pork in order to be right with God. That's not what it's about. What it's about is love and peace for the weaker. And that leads us to the third kingdom value, and that is sacrifice. Amen. Sacrifice. Look at verse 20. Amen. He says, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make, a, uh, to make another stumble by what he eats. Meaning you, you are free to enjoy what God permits. But we are not free to cause another to stumble. To stumble is to falter in their pathway of following Jesus Christ. 
And if me exercising my freedoms could lead my weaker brother toward greed or sensuality or back into drugs and alcohol or into some form of idolatry, then I ought to not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. So when is it right then to not eat meat or drink wine? Verse 21 tells us. He says, it is not good to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. So that's when you ought to refrain. Notice he doesn't stop with, it is not good to eat meat or drink wine, period. But he qualifies this statement. in uh, Doing anything that would cause your brother to stumble. Verse 22, the very next verse, is often misunderstood. He says, the faith that you have then, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. It's often misunderstood in this way. Often I've heard people quote this verse and to, to misinterpret it to mean, hey, you don't like what I'm doing? Keep that between you and God. You know, you think premarital sex is wrong, and I think it's okay. Keep your faith between you and God. Don't, don't, uh, don't ever address any sin issue in my life. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. I've heard people even apply this so far as to say, hey, don't even share the gospel with people. Just let it be a very personal faith between you and God, and let other people kind of find their own path. That's not what he's saying. Faith, in verse 22, is connected with his definition of faith in verse 1. And in verse 1, he's using faith as a nickname for the ability to eat or drink to the glory of God, meaning it's this certain measure of faith, a measure of understanding in Jesus Christ that they're able to participate in these liberties in Christ to the glory of God. And Paul goes on to say that that is good. Look what he says. He says, blessed is the one who has not, no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. You're blessed if you have this measure of faith. But we don't eat or drink as a way to merely advertise our authorization from God. We are to sacrifice and give up our freedoms for the sake of another. And this does chafe at our flesh, doesn't it? Because the strong want to despise those that are weak, and the weak want to despise, want to judge those that are strong. And both camps want to destroy one another. But we are called instead of to a life of destruction and lines and gossip and separation, we're called to love and peace, and in order to arrive there, to lay aside our liberties for the sake of another. If I could close with a a parable that I'm going to borrow and tweak from an author. There's a ship with a whole bunch of sailors who are very different from each other, yet they were all the same. They were the same in this way. The captain of this ship had rescued each one of these sailors from the icy waters, from their various shipwrecks. Was that just my ears or was that yours as well? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Men from all different backgrounds, men from different countries, men from opposing navies were rescued by this captain and all brought into this ship. And if you looked at all of the sailors on the ship, you would have been confused because there were some men who still wore their previous Navy uniforms. And they promoted a very rigid kind of discipline. And they embraced all of their traditions and their cultures, while other men wore regular clothing. Street clothes, plain clothes. Some were poor, and some of the sailors were those rescued from luxury ships. Now, over time, those on the ship began arguing among themselves and dividing among themselves. 
and those who embraced their old uniforms judged those that did not wear the uniform and could, they could not imagine how this captain would allow people on the ship who don't wear the right uniform. And those who did not wear the uniform, they despised those who thought that they still had to wear a uniform on this rescue ship. And they were about to throw each other overboard until the captain called a big meeting and he said, all right, we got to bring it together. And he says, we must, for the sake of one another, pursue love and peace. Why? Do you realize what I have sacrificed to rescue you? You see, look, as we look to Christ, what we see is the embodiment of all of this. Like, do you realize how much Jesus laid aside for the sake of your soul? No one had more freedoms than Christ. It was his right to be equal with God. Yet he did not consider equality something to be grasped. It was his right to be arrayed in luxury. Yet he emptied himself. It was his right to be served. Yet he took on the form of a servant. It was his right to have a reputation. Yet he made himself of no reputation. It was his right to be praised. Yet he humbled himself. It was his right to live. Yet he humbled himself even to the point of death. And that is death on the cross. See his hum humility. See his love. See his pursuit of our peace with God. And see his sacrifice. And friends, you then sacrifice so that the weaker might love Christ. Therefore, God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you that Jesus sacrificed for us. Lord, let us live in the wonder and the beauty and the light and the glory of that sacrifice. And God, as we see Christ and as we want our weaker brothers to see Christ, I pray that we would be willing to sacrifice and to lay aside our liberties and never do anything that would, that would cause somebody to stumble so that they might, they might see Christ, love Christ. God, we thank you for dying for the weak. We thank you for dying for the strong. May we keep our eyes focused on you, our captain. May we have unity. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.